Music is off. Ah, ah, it's working. Yep. Yeah. Uh, hello and welcome to our Fesco Fesco meeting session. So we are here. I think it's all of us. No, it's not all of us. Yep. Yeah. And we are here to basically answer any of your questions if you have any. So please go on and shoot. You will be provided with mic. If you have some, if you don't have any, we will be talking about stuff. Yeah, I should introduce ourselves. Yeah, yeah. So my hi, my name is Tomáš. I'm relatively new to Fesco. Uh, this is my first term, uh, and I'm working in the CPE team. I was part of Federal Lease Engineering for about five years, and I will just pass the mic so everybody can introduce themselves. Um, so I'm Zbyszek. I have been in Fesco for. Uh, like three years or five years, and uh, I work on System D and a bunch of other things. Hi, I'm Steve Gallagher. I've been on Fesco, I think, about a decade now, maybe a little longer. Um, second only to uh, this next gentleman here. Uh, yeah, I'm Kevin Finzi. I've been on Fesco back when it was the four hour extra steering committee. <laughs> so I do lots of things, and hopefully, most of you know me. Hi, I'm Michelle. I've been in Fedora for maybe about 20 years, mostly doing packaging. Um, I'm new to Fesco, and I mostly work on Rust and uh, Apple these days. I'm uh, David Cantrell. I've been on Fesco, I don't know how many years, but I know it was during the pandemic was when I got elected. So like last year was the first time we met in person, I, I think. Um, but yeah, I work on uh, DNF and RPM and a lot of things in the OS. I've been working on Fedora for like 20 years, I think, so. Uh, I'm Neil Gompa. I've been involved in Fedora for uh, almost 20 years now, and uh, I've been on Fesco since 2020, so yay, the pandemic ushered my existence in Fesco. Um, I do lots of stuff here and there, just little bits and things like that. So uh, we had a plan to hold a live uh, voting session today, but unfortunately all the tickets that were uh, up on the agenda got resolved without the need for a live vote. <laughs> uh, they all got approved also, so boring. Uh, so yeah, um, if you have questions, then please ask questions. Did the email go out? No, they're all tagged pending announcement. Okay. So uh, to see this a little bit, I, uh, I do note that we had uh, in the last couple of weeks at least uh, two, let's call them controversial tickets, mm. and I want, um, at the risk of uh, potentially relitigating them, I did want to give people an opportunity to, uh, if they had concerns about the decision we made, to bring them up in a public forum. So. <laughs> I mean, I've got all. I've got this perfectly good chair. <laughs> wow, tough crowd. Okay. True. Um, I'm technically the mic runner too, so sorry. <laughs> Um, what has been one of your like most exciting changes that you've seen in the last few releases of Fedora Linux that you saw come in, you really were excited to, to see happen in the distribution? Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, so for me, it's probably the change by Neil and bunch of guys, which is about the KDA uh, and AR um, images. So this is something that I'm really excited about because we are missing those. And it will be really nice to have a KDA desktop on my AR board. So. Yeah, and part of that is going to involve more retooling of the rel tooling so that it's less broken on ARM. So that's going to be fun. Um, but yeah, I'm excited for it too. And actually, like, most of the KD SIG were, were the ones that wanted it to happen in the first place. They were they were surprised that we weren't already there. So that's why we're doing it. Uh, so I am a big fan of the uh, 
controversial change to introduce um, well, telemetry or uh, uh, feedback Metrics. about what users are doing. Metrics. 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 Um, so I've been, uh, I, I came to Fedora from Debian and uh, Debian has Popcorn and I was very envious of Popcorn uh, for, uh, well, all the time. Uh, and I think that uh, we could direct the work we do as packagers uh, better at things that are used rather than at things that are not used. And it's very, very, very hard to say uh, whether a given package is totally unused or is used and works or has some bugs but people just don't care enough to report or um, you know or maybe it's widely used and everybody likes it and it's I think that metrics will give us an insight into that and will make uh, Fedora maintainers more productive so uh this may come as a surprise to some of you, uh, or maybe, maybe not, but I think the most interesting of the proposed changes we've had in the last couple of years was the somewhat out of nowhere uh, proposal to change uh, Fedora Workstation to KDE. Um, <laughs> and, and not just because I thrive on chaos. You totally thrive on chaos. It, it, but not just not that. Um, now, honestly, I thought that uh, the conversation that that spawned was one that we desperately as a project needed to have about uh, the placement of the different uh, of the different teams, because, yeah, uh, and 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 as you'll see in, in Neil's talk la uh, later about the revival of KDE, it has come a long way in the last ten years since we for, uh, since we first built a workstation. And I think it it is, really is time to talk about the fact that it is getting at least as much investment uh, in in its development than uh, than GNOME is and. I think, it, I, th I think it's a conversation we need to have as a, as a group. And I, I know that this uh, change was uh, pulled back, but I think that the conversation it spawned was absolutely necessary, and I'm glad that happened. For what it's worth, it hasn't been pulled back yet. It's still sitting in our docket for 42. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, uh, one of the things that... Uh, that I liked in recent releases, and this was kind of behind the scenes, and people probably didn't know it too much, is uh, moving some of our stuff to Kiwi, which uh, Neil worked on, and Adam and I worked on a lot. And uh, I, it, it's just, it's helped us move off some old things, or try to, or move in that direction, we're, or whatever we're working you want to call it. We're it. getting yeah. there. Um, and there's been a lot of those sort of infrastructure things in the last couple releases, which I think are good, but it's hard to like, you know, highlight anything big, but you know, there's DNF five, there's a new version of RPM, RPM itself. There's all those kind of changes going on, and those are going on all the time in Fedora. But they are really valuable. It's really good to to keep all the technology moving forward like that. So I, I think that's been good. Kevin already mentioned DNF and um, RPM, so like I'll say. Um, I'll pick one that I'm really excited about for like workstation, especially since it's for workstation, right, for developers, um, enabling frame pointers by default, which will make uh, Fedora much more useful as a development platform because you can do performance profiling properly. So I get to listen to everyone else's, uh, you know, their, their comments here and think about mine. Uh, it, it is hard to pick just one uh, one main thing that, that, that I was really excited about, or, or a group of things, um, but I think overall in past releases, r recent releases, like so some years, uh, is Fedora's move to uh, Wayland uh, by default, and just seeing the overall, I mean, that was, that, that's a very difficult change to pull off. You, oh you know God, it's gonna yes. be bumpy, but you kinda, at some point you have to get that in users' hands so that you can start dealing with, you know, cleaning up the rough edges and, and the bug reports you never saw in testing. Um, I think Fedora, I think we handled that really well. And I enjoyed seeing the reviews of Fedora releases where Wayland was default and, and people giving it, you know, really, really good reviews and, and good feedback. That was nice to see. To me, it, 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 it felt like we made the right decisions at the right time. So that, that's mine. Yes, you and the microphone, man. <laughs> well, he's holding it. Uh, 
just to add to that briefly, I think that's always been one of Fedora's strengths is that we're willing to make the bold choice sometimes. Um, you know, I'm sure you recall when we added System D. To, <laughs> <laughs> to that was minor. That was minor. Oh, it was very minor. It was uh -huh. very minor. No, that was a, that was a oh, huge. Well, technically, it went so smoothly that nobody remembers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to repeat that into the mic? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but but seriously, that was a that was a bold move, and it was one that got a lot of pushback, just like the Wayland one did. And ultimately, I think we can all agree it has proven proven itself out. And I think the same is true is proving true of Wayland. So yeah. Um, so everyone else has said all these other things that I could have picked off the top of my head. So now <laughs> I, I have to go. I have to go back a little bit further back. But I would actually say. Um, Butterfest, the change to Butterfest was probably the most exciting one because on top of it basically being one of the very few changes where almost every team of Fedora actually signed off on directly, um, it, w it also kind of, uh, it demonstrated in an, in an unusual way how we are both first and, in, and leading in, in these kinds of things because it kind of kick-started um, in other communities and other places about we should be thinking about storage. It's not just a place to have files, it's also an opportunity in which to improve the user experience and to do good things. And we started seeing a lot of innovation coming from other communities, upstream stuff and things like that. And that's what really we're here for, is like we're an integrator, but we're also a progenitor. We, we start things that other people follow up on and, and we take that and bring it back and, and, and create a virtuous cycle of improvement. So uh, it's, it's a very good point. Uh, it was a very successful change, despite the worries that people had. Uh, and I think that we should ask ourselves uh, how we can continue it, right? Because, for example, the idea to have snapshots f with ButterFS, uh, it was mentioned. Uh, it's a technical possibility, but it would require some rethinking and some uh, well, some heavy work to happen, and I mean, should we do this? Um, yeah, this is probably a good um, chance to actually mention that uh, some of us working on ButterFS are forming a ButterFS SIG, so if you're interested, um, I announced it last week, but uh, we'll set up the communication channel after Flock. Um, I wanted to return to the topic of KD, uh, just, just to wrap this up. Uh, one of the ideas that was floated was to make the landing page uh, more equal and to, to, for example, to have KDE as a, a choice that is visible somewhere on the, on the first page and then you can, well, just scroll down a bit and, and download it instead of going through three pages and, and knowing exactly what you are looking for. Uh, I think we should make this happen. I would like that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Adam Williamson, Fedora QA. I, not to poop on any parades, but going back to the timing of the Wayland thing, and also not to be the guy from the <laughs> internet, but how are we going to deal with the accessibility issues around Wayland? Uh, you know, it's a fair question. Um, so the Fedora Accessibility Working Group thing that was just started a few months ago, um, they're already starting to kind of look at this, at least um, I can mostly speak on the Fedora KD side because the Fedora Workstation side, we really haven't processed that much. On the Fedora KD side, one of the conditions that um, the team had for going to Wayland by default and then eventually Wayland only was making sure that the accessibility stack actually worked. So like when you use Orca and Orca doesn't crash on its own for reason A, B, C or another, um, it can see all the Wayland applications, it can respond to them and you get the, um, the information being read back to you. The modifiers and stuff that people tend to expect in a, uh, in, in when you're operating it as if you're a blind person. Um, unfortunately, the ones that Orca itself knows that it needs to propagate don't show up, but in, in uh, KD Plasma, you can turn it on so that the global shortcuts from any application will just automatically work and respond. We also have punched holes by default to make some of those shortcuts actually activate anyway, as opposed to having to wait for Orca to do something special for the environment. Um, those, are the, like, those are the kinds of extra steps 
that we, can, we took to try to make that experience better. I understand that not every desktop either A, has the capability to do that, or B, the willingness to. But in general, when it comes to accessibility, it's kind of on us as integrators to take that extra step to be pragmatic here and enable these people to be successful in the platforms. Because otherwise, it, it, it's just not gonna work. And, and to add to that, um, I, I think we reached a point you know, we had been hearing from the engineers who work on, you know, everything related to the graphics stack and the and and the desktop, you know, periphery and things like that. That the um, architecture around X was sort of at a dead end, and that future work would be focused around Wayland. So we we really we just need to. We needed the distribution position there so that we can actually have that future work identified and you know completed. Even though it kind of, in in some ways, might feel like we're doing it again, um, that's really just I don't know. It it's where it had to go, I guess. Um, in some cases, we just nothing happens unless we start doing it. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and I also want to add that I think that, uh, I mean, from what I know, that the, the state of accessibility wasn't great anyway uh, under X. So saying that we will not to move to Wayland uh, because of what we have, we, uh, it, it was har hardly worth blocking on, I think. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I guess we've had some rather controversial changes recently with the telemetry discussion and the DNF5 discussion that kind of just went off the rails. Uh, does FESCO have any ideas to how to perhaps make those kind of changes go less off the rails in the future? I don't know if I would want to. Yeah. Um, I think it's uh, just a question of general culture of discussion, right? And um, if uh, FESCO members were, um, well, violating the code of conduct on the mailing lists, then it would be a question directed at us. But I don't think, think that we are. I think it's uh, uh, something that we as a community as a whole need to, to figure out how to, well, have discussions in a more productive and more polite way. Uh, I think I think what Matthew is possibly going to say here is that the first uh, telemetry discussion we had, uh, if you look at that on on discussion.fedoraproject.org, it is by far the biggest thing on there, and it had lots of sub things and threads moved off and uh, you know things moved around and, and just a lot of uh, vitriol and things you know removed that were bad and whatever. Uh, I, with this second uh, metrics discussion, there were actually some things that we did to make the discussion better. Uh, Matthew added polls to the changes so that yeah. people who wanted to just say, I don't like this, I, this is bad, could just say, I don't like this in the poll and not you know, add another comment. And I think we were a lot more proactive about um, you know, how, how, to, how, to, how to frame it. Uh, I think the change owners also took a lot of feedback into account, and I think that actually helped a lot of the people who were very against the original proposal came back and said, okay, well, now you've, done, you've taken my concerns, I, I could probably live with this, or I could be convinced that this is good. So I think the discussion uh, got better, and I think we were just kind of unprepared for that first metrics discussion you know, the way it happened, so. Yeah, I, that was exactly it, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, to add to that, uh, based on the original question about how do we prevent things from getting out of hand in the conversations, uh, I'm not sure that's something we, act I mean, we want to make sure that, uh, that uh, conversations remain civil, but I don't think we ever want them, uh, I don't think we ever want to be restricting what people can and can't say, because I think we absolutely want to hear from our yeah, community, and we want to know that they care about this important. This is one, oh, okay. Um, Yes, I agree with you, except I want to remind everyone that we do have a code of conduct in Fedora. And so when, sometimes conversations get very heated. Um, 
it, it, it's really easy for people to have a different persona when communicating online through email or a discussion forum. Um, I think events like this where we get to meet in person and you know we get to socialize as well as have these conversations and talks uh, is really good for the community. And I have seen people that 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 come to talks they're, 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 or come to conferences were in person. I have seen them either directly or indirectly diffuse a situation on a mailing list thread where they just offer another opinion. It's like, I think you, you misread this because here's how I read it. And, and that, that kind of uh, behavior on these discussion topics really does help. Um, but at the same time, sometimes people will go kind of uh, way off the rails and, and we do have to uh, uh, call that out. So yes, there is a code of conduct and it's important. <laughs> I also want to point out that uh, just deciding not to do it publicly and berating people privately is also not okay. Uh, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of speaking a little bit from personal experience, a couple of controversial changes as they were considered controversial when they went through the retrospect that they were probably fine to begin with. Um, I have been subject to a lot of things that should probably have never, would never be allowed on a, on a public forum are definitely not okay in a private forum. So even if you think that it's a, if you think it's not sub good for a public venue and then you want to send that same kind of vitriol to someone privately, that's still not okay. And the Fedora Code of Conduct does apply to everyone who communicates to another Fedora member, even in a private fashion. Did somebody yes. want it? Okay, so I, I apologize in advance if this is a little bit of a hairy question, but where do you see FESCO's role in the future of Fedora with AIML? Oh, I am I sorry. Like <laughs> um, I, think, I think we could do a, a very good job uh, packaging up and giving people the tools so that they can use to f do whatever they want and the tools that are free and open source and you know match all of our guidelines. I think that's really important. I think people are gonna start using these things to contribute to Fedora. And my personal view, <clears throat> my personal view of it is we shouldn't care that they're using something like this to contribute. Uh, we should just judge the co contribution like we would if they were just directly com contributing it. Uh, so if you use a, a an AI thing to uh, create a change or create a, a thing that you're you're trying to submit and it's bad or wrong or whatever, then it should be flagged as bad or wrong or whatever, just as if you wrote it up that way. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of change in this industry. There already has been. You know, even just this year, there's been so much change in this. Uh, I think it's going to continue to change, but I, I think. We can provide people with tools. We can watch the technology and see where it's going to be useful to us. Uh, it's really kind of hard to tell what things are going to be useful and what are just going to be hallucination generating things. What FESCO's role will be related to this is, is hard to think about, but I, I'll mention my main concern as it uh, relates to open source software and our entire industry. Um, I do have a, a strong concern with, with using AI to generate code or patches to open source software, especially large language models that have been trained on software that I and many of us have written and are out there. Uh, these systems don't understand open source licenses and what's allowed to be used together. I mean, we barely understand it. We get into very heated conversations about what can be linked together. Uh, but all that aside, open source licenses are very important to all of us, I think. Uh, we wouldn't be doing this if, if it wasn't important. And I feel that there is a risk of using these systems to generate code or patches and they're trained off open source software, we risk eroding sort of the entire idea of different types of open source licenses because you'll get to a point where someone will say, 
well, I don't really care. You know, I generated the code and it works. You know, I, and, and we'll lose kind of decades of, you know, creating these different types of licenses and, and terms and things like that. So I think that's a, a, a really real risk that, that projects like Fedora should pay attention to. Um, I don't know how Fesco can help with that, except maybe make people aware that that's you know a concern, uh, and and we should be careful. Um, but that's just my one my one major concern with it. Um, were you next? Or you? I, yeah. I I mean, on top of what uh, David here has said, like my my personal concern actually kind of goes a little deeper than that, and it's more ethical rather than than legal is attribution. Like one of the things that, I mean, it's it's starting to be a problem even if before you put um, the LLM generated goop into the mix is that um, people's attribution is not a thing that is being as highly valued as it used to be culturally. And that concerns me because for a lot of people, especially volunteer types, like, you know, most of my open source work has been me just doing it, and the only thing I kind of get out of it in the end is like someone knows that I did it. And if you take my stuff and then strip my attribution from it and then kind of put it out there, it's plagiarism. And that is super not okay, what LLMs allow you to do. And I kind of refuse to call them AI because it's not really what it is. There's no intelligence behind it in any philosophical or, or mechanical sense. But like what these LLMs do is that they take all these large data sets and they use it to do pattern recognition and spit out something that kind of looks like what you wanted, maybe, but it's all based on stuff that other people did, but you have no connection to that stuff and you don't know. And if something has been reproduced en masse from something that already existed, you're not gonna know that and it's effectively been washed away. That's my biggest concern from a moral and ethical perspective is you are losing the connection to what these people did for you. What's that? Okay. Uh, if you want to add. Yeah, I have, I, I have something for this. Yeah, so I have something to add uh, for what N Neil said. And that is like, uh, from what I'm hearing, I, I hear uh, people thinking about things like uh, ChatGPT or, or some other services that will do stuff for you. But for me, I am, I'm really excited about uh, being able to have my own LLM that I trained on my own code that will be able to write my own. And this is something that I'm uh, really excited about and something that we should consider in Fedora. And we should create the ground, as Kevin mentioned, like make things packaged, make things easier for people to use them to deploy it uh, locally where they, where they want to, and to train it on their data. Or, on, or, or have a policy from Fedora side of things, like, yeah, this is the patch set, these are the data that you can use to train your model. Because it will be, for example, all of the RPM specs that we have in, in project, and then we'll be maybe able to generate better RPM specs for the, for the rest of the project. But it requires a policies and it requires uh, some guidance. Like, yes, th these are the things that we are willing to um, be consumed by LLMs, and we encourage people or Fedora contributors to do that and trade their own models and use them to, to contribute to Fedora, which might be extremely beneficial in documentation, especially in documentation, because let's, let's face it, LLM is nothing else than a vector of characters, right? It's, it's nothing else. <laughs> so uh, I, for one, am uh, very anxious about uh, LLMs uh, for a very specific reason. I'm, I'm concerned that sooner or later people are going to realize that a, an LLM chatbot uh, could almost certainly replace me on Fesco. <laughs> no you. Thank you, Neil. I appreciate that. But uh, I mean, it, kidding aside, uh, one of the things that I'm concerned about is uh, the number of places in, uh, where, even even when done with good intent, people are using uh, uh, ChatGPT and other LLMs to produce the, produce the arguments that they are making. Uh, so in some cases, this is in the best of intention because you may not be, English may not be your first language and you're using this as a mechanism to, uh, to make yourself more, better understood, which also carries with it risks of, uh, you know, you don't know that the translation is accurate. Uh, and I've seen that cause a few problems recently as well. So uh, yeah, I guess my biggest concern about, uh, about LLMs is the high rate of mistakes 
that are likely to cause con more confusion than they necessarily are, are saving in time. And I don't think that that goes, I, I, th I think that doesn't get talked about enough uh, because people are too excited about what they can do and less about what they should do. Uh, I'll just add one that I uh, read recently that people aren't really talking about very much, so I don't know if it's just something that people hadn't, it hadn't occurred to most people, but uh, another problem with, uh, even say you got your large language model, it's trained on a bunch of software, it can write uh, this, this function for you, it can do all this stuff for you, that's great. Without mistakes, everything's perfect. Um, where is the next generation of software engineers? Who knows this stuff anymore, right? Everybody retires that actually learned to code, and then you have people who just say, hey, chat GBT, make me this thing, and they don't really understand that. And also, a large part of software engineering isn't writing the code. If, if you look at the percentages of time you, know, you spend, a lot of software engineering is, what is the problem? What is the problem I'm trying to solve? What is the, the thing here that I'm trying to solve? And then you get to the part where you write the code and you test the code. And, but there's a lot of, uh, ideally there's a lot of, of thought that goes into the, the front end of this process. And I, I'm worried that these changes will result in less thinking about how the problem is. I, I do agree with that. I, I want to add one point that's not AI, but it's kind of the same thing you said, and it's about post-pandemic returning to work. Um, at Red Hat, we have, I work in the Boston office, and we have a large number of uh, early career associates, uh, one to three years they've been working there, and they all come into the office because they were hired during the pandemic and they want to have that sort of water cooler talk, that sort of knowledge transfer that you get from talking to mid-career or late-career associates. And those people aren't coming in. They're all working from home. <laughs> so that's, uh, we have that problem <laughs> in a way, but it's not AI. Anyway, I just, you know, want to, yeah. I'll, I'll do it quick and then you can add it. Uh, I wanted to second on to David Cantrell's point here about like the, the whole lack of mentorship stuff that's even happening in the professional space. Like, I wouldn't be where I am if I didn't, you know, for my early career part, I was in an office with other senior people in so many different disciplines that could, like, I could go and ask stuff and things. And the ability to have unstructured conversations to gain knowledge and understanding is one of the most powerful tools we as humans have that so far have not seen anything else replicate. And so that is something to always keep in mind. And that doesn't necessarily have to be an in-person thing. It can also be virtual, remote, whatever. But like you have to have this culture of, of, of this kind of engagement being acceptable. Otherwise, people don't learn. I will just add to it because I think we already are in that state. We already are in that problem. And the problem is cloud, right? It's the Kubernetes containerization and stuff. We, we have a new wave of engineers who can spawn cloud instance, who can do Kubernetes work, but when you ask them about package management, about the stuff that operating system does, about signaling, for example, about memory management, they are lost. And we have the same problem, right? There's the same problem that we will be facing with the, with the machine learning stuff sooner or later. Uh, one thing I would like to uh, volunteer and uh, ask my uh, fellow FESCO members to volunteer to do is be a mentor. Pick, you know, uh, go out uh, and actively, uh, actively uh, try to conscript a mentee in the Fedora project. See if we, see if we can't actually, you know, we're some of the more senior and, and uh, well-known figures in the, uh, in the Fedora community. Let's find some, uh, some young folks and actually take them under our wing. Maybe even ideally find somebody to take our seat when we decide that we've had enough. <laughs> hey, uh, so you talked earlier about some of the disruptive changes in the past. Uh, I know technology is hard to predict, but pull out your crystal balls and maybe uh, what, what big technologies do you think, uh, technology changes do you think we might see over the next, I don't know, let's say three years to pick a random number? So, um, 
the switch to an image-based mode uh, Linux um, is, well, it's happening, uh, and I think it should happen. Um, though the, the problem is that it's um, not flexible enough for development. Uh, so um, I think that well, I think that we should we should make it happen, and I think we should figure out ways to make it uh, good enough for everyday use on a laptop where you work on. Uh, and I think that this will lead to more reliability and uh, well, things being better. I hope. Um, so yeah, so this this is the one for me, and uh, I also think that. Uh, Despite lots of people working on, on it, uh, also in Fedora, um, we are not really mentally prepared for, for this. Um, some stuff that should be happening is happening more slowly than, than, than I would like it to happen. That's why I expand on, I expand on that br uh, briefly. Uh, one of the things I see uh, image mode bringing is Something, something I've uh, chatted to many of you about uh, at random over the last 10 years, but the possibility of actually completely rethinking our packaging. Uh, image mode does not necessarily have to be have to build from RPMs, and I know that's going to I, I know that that's going to start murmurs throughout this room. Uh, but I think it, I, I think if we're having this you know once in a generation monumental shift, it's probably the time to start looking at whether or not. Uh, whether, whether we're building on uh, a solid foundation or quicksand with, uh, with RPM. So, uh. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, actually I was going to say that, and um, I, I say that as someone who works on RPM and DNF. Um, I think within the next three years, we're, uh, I mean, we're already kind of seeing this with uh, things like Flatpak and, and other mechanisms to deliver software, but I think there is going to be more of a need for projects like Fedora to directly embrace um, upstream uh, and language-based uh, package sort of delivery mechanisms, um, thinking of like Python, like PyPy, um, with, with like the need for us to repackage that as an RPM, maybe that time has passed um, because when you look at people doing development for a company uh, and they very quickly set up their container, the containers are not long-lived, uh, so do we really need to go to that work and I, I or go through all that work to um, just deliver the same module as an RPM? Uh, what, what's the value there? So I think that we're going to really have to look at, and it's not just Python, it's, you know, kind of every language ecosystem in a way has their own kind of system like this. Um, and if, if you think about it compared to the Windows platform where that has more of a, uh, external, you know, software delivery. That's not you don't get everything directly from my, you know. And I should preface this by saying the last time I used Windows was NT4, so I don't, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, but but really, I mean, like Microsoft is not the the single vendor for all of those tools. You have, you know, different ecosystems that developers can use, and I think that we're going to have to get to that point as a Linux vendor is just recognize that our users are doing that and how do we best incorporate that into the system. So I'm going to have the hot take here and say that we're on a pendulum and it will swing both, uh, both directions every few years. We've been on in a trajectory towards um, singular systems because where you have, every, you have coarse images that have all these things and someone has curated all this stuff for you. What's going to happen eventually, what I see is that there's going to be an eventual point where people are like, this is actually too coarse for me, and then we'll swing back the other direction. Um, and I think this is going to keep happening because we've, it keep, even in the Windows world, you know, and you said NT4, right? Like, so after NT4, Microsoft moved to an image-based um, deployment mechanism for Windows. Windows installations are image-based, or have been. What's been happening recently is that they've swung back towards componentizing their installations. Um, what I think is actually going to be the next step is that we should probably start looking 
at how we do package management and change the actual mechanism of package management. So one of the things that we do, and this is kind of getting into the weeds, is that RPM is actually an archive format fundamentally. And because it's an archive format, it has to be read, scanned, unpacked, and transferred. But what if we didn't have to do half of those steps? So even if you're doing a componentized Linux, and that's an old phrase, if you've been around long enough, you know what I'm, why I said that. But even if you're doing a componentized Linux, you could deliver even all those components you know, that we ship as RPM archives, well, we could have RPM images. And those images could then be mounted and construct a virtual file system layer because they're all not conflicting anyway. So there are opportunities to improve, optimize, construct, deconstruct, do whatever to make things more flexible while making them safer and more reliable. What we haven't been, we've been thinking about going towards an extreme. We haven't really thought about what happens when we wanna stop the pendulum from swinging. And I think that's what's gonna happen over the next three to five years is that we've swung so far in one direction, we're gonna start realizing that there's so many flaws here on this side, we'll wanna swing to the other direction, but somebody will probably step up hopefully and say, what if we stopped somewhere in the middle? And I think that's where, I mean, whether this is upstream software or distribution package software, in the long term, this is where I think things are gonna go. And, and we've, we've seen tepid movements towards this. Um, Daniel's, I think it was uh, Stratberg, or is it Michael Stratberg, uh, from, formerly from Debian, he experimented with an image-based package management system and canonical with their SNAP system, if you look at it, with, you know, and you twist your eyes a little bit, it looks like a, it's an image-based package management system. Those are the kinds of things I think we should start looking towards as we move towards even these singular systems or these atomic updating systems because componentized makes it a lot more flexible and I think this is the direction we actually are going to go even if we don't necessarily as Fedora have a concept yet of what that's gonna look like. One thing that's a bit unique um, in Linux uh, compared to other OSs like Windows and uh, Mac OS is that we we package the world. Like basically, you can get most of the stuff you need, like just by you know DNF install, app install something, and that's a blessing and a curse. If you um, you know like if you work in a large company and you have like a most of your even fellow engineers say like I don't care about RPM packaging, but I need to use like a new version of the software. Please make it available. And you're like, oh shoot, you know that's actually not easy. And if you have to work with like a vendor provider software, you'll discover that you know like um, even those who actually make their packages might not know exactly how to do it properly. So I think one thing that really needs to happen tooling wise is making it easier for people to produce good packages, whether it's RPMs or devs or like Flatpak or something else. Uh, just to add on a little bit to what Neil was saying, I don't know that image mode and uh, componentization necessarily have to be all that different. I think that's one of the that's main. The way, well, that's the way people are looking at it right now. That's why I'm describing it that way. Okay, uh, just to repeat for the uh, for the mic, uh, he was saying that he thinks that that's what the way people are looking at it right now, which is probably true. Um, I think that uh, one of the big things that's coming from the Bootsy efforts, and especially uh, stuff uh, like the uh, the Universal Blue uh, side of the, uh, the house, is. Uh, we're building components at, a, at an image layer per, uh, perspective rather than necessarily right at the RPM level. And I think that's something we need to explore more. And uh, again, like, like you were saying, I think those, some of those were really good ideas that would, that would absolutely be usable in an image mode, uh, you know, in a Bootsy type con uh, container as well. And uh, again, that, yeah, like you said, it's kind of swinging the pendulum to the middle. And I think that's a, a really good idea that we need to explore. So, um I kind of disagree with this uh, view that uh, we uh, will stop using RPMs. I hope that this will not happen. Uh, in the sense that um, I see uh, RPM as a good enough way to to deliver stuff. And uh, I, for example, for, for Python software and Rust and Go and whatever, uh, five other, Language, language models, Zig and, and so on. Um, I think we should make it really, really easy and automatic uh, to, to convert from the language specific um, system to RPM. Uh, and ideally this will be like a, a one line thing that you, you, you can just invoke a tool and you get an RPM after half a second. Um, the problem 
why we cannot do it yet is that it's not that RPM is not good enough, it's that the um, the language specific stuff is usually limited. I mean, I, I'm most familiar with Python, and if you do just do pure Python, then it, it's, it all works nicely, but then you need to, you know, add a bit of C, and then it becomes very hard, and then you need to add a man page, and it's just impossible, because the Python stuff, it, it wasn't designed for generic uh, um, installation of things and you know an installation or multiple versions uh, I mean it's all not flexible enough and that's why we have a problem with uh, turning the language specific description into an RPM uh, but what has been happening is that the, the language specific descriptions have been improving and our tooling has been improving in, in, in at the same time and we are moving towards, uh, especially recently with the build system RPM new new thing where you specify that this is a spec for, for I don't know, uh, PyProject Python and it just gives you uh, the defaults for the install, build, prep sections. So you can have a, a, a Python specific spec file that has the, the name, the version, the description, and then uh, two or three lines more, right? And um, I hope that we, we can keep building RPMs and do it more quickly, and then we can use the RPMs to build uh, images, normal systems, uh, initRDs, containers, uh, RPM OS3, flat packs, and so on and so on. And uh, I hope that we keep this, uh, this, this the RPM as this, this middle, uh, yes, and also use it to resolve dependencies properly. Uh, we're almost out of time. Uh, one question more? Oh. 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 Okay. Okay. Uh, well, while we're getting the mic over there, I just want to add one really quick thing before we we end. How many people out here are Packager sponsors? Any sponsors in the audience? Okay. Um, I happen to notice that our Packager sponsors tracking thing has about like 10 people, 10 tickets in it. And they're all tickets where somebody said, you know, package something and there was questions. Somebody said, oh, you have to have your review finished or you have to do this. And so they haven't, you know, gone forward in the process. But if sponsors could go look at those and go talk to those people and look at those review tickets and actually move that along, because some of them have been waiting a long time. So I just wanted to mention that. No, it's, I think the oldest one is like a few months now at this point, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I'd also like to push back a little bit against the idea that the work we do uh, for packaging language stuff, especially Python, is not valuable. I think the work that we've done with early integration of new Python versions and doing a ton of work upstream has been, in fact, very valuable. And it's actually been formally recognized by the Python community just how valuable the work that Fedora does for Python has been to the overall ecosystem. And even now, there's an ongoing change upstream to completely revamp the way that Python does uh, licensing metadata, which is being led by people from the Fedora Python SIG, uh, which will you know, help people, whether they're consuming stuff from PyPy directly or if they're distributions who want to further automatize the way that uh, packaging of this stuff works. Um, well, other than that, uh, my question was, uh, what is the FESCO opinion on the Git Forge change, and how do you all plan to participate or, I guess, not participate in that change? And I see that Neil is head desking right now, so sorry about that. Well, uh, yeah, no, hold on. I, I want to respond to the, the I, I, I want to respond to the Python thing. That that may have been a bad example. Um, I was trying to pick a hypothetical for three years down the road. And what I was basing that on is what I see non-Fedora community members do when they go and set up a Fedora system, like to do work at their random company. They follow instructions to st install modules 
that don't use our tools. They follow like the language specific tools. So that's what I was thinking of. I'm not trying to downplay the importance of, of the work of, of any team in Fedora. My apologies for that. Um, um, sorry, can I just add a quick note before we get to the game yeah, yeah. thing? Because yeah. that was what I had my hand up for. I just wanted to say the things Big Neo is talking about with Python specs that just magically work. I believe there's a current proposal that is basically that. Like someone is actually doing it. So All I just right. wanted to note that that's a real thing. Someday we'll have it for us too. Yeah. And I think Nero has a working Great. Product. That's it, yeah. yeah. And I'm not going to comment on the Get Forge thing, uh, except well, at the top. Pimp the talk. <laughs> right, yeah. So uh, we're basically out of time. So yes, go to the talk. There's a talk on the Git Forge uh, later, but um, Fesco has. Uh, nominated me to uh, sit in on those conversations and get, and get involved there. Uh, I am withholding an opinion uh, despite initial biases uh, because I want to make sure that this is, uh, the, the decisions that we make are right for Fedora and I don't have all the information yet. Uh, I, I think that uh, basically the uh, method that we proposed the last time this, this was discussed like, you know, a year and a half ago, basically list the requirements and then figure out what option checks the most requirements and what we can compromise on and what we shouldn't compromise on and then make a decision. I think that's the same way to approach this and this is what is happening more or less. So since I'm leading the investigation, I can just say that we are just trying to, exactly as Bishi mentioned, like just get the requirements from all the impacted teams at, in Fedora, which was not going greatly, but we are making progress, and just see and m make an evaluation. Can Forgeo or can Giti check all the boxes or most of the boxes? Or maybe even we might end up in a situation when we will realize that keeping Pagura and extending it might be much simpler than doing anything else. But it's not, it's not necessarily a good idea, but it, you are, you're shaking your head, but do you know that? Are you sure about that? Did you yes. did you get the requirements? Like, do you have all the requirements? Do you know how how uh, complicated is it to extend GitLab, for example, for some feature that we need? Like, At the core level, uh, as it's underneath the UI. Yeah. I, I, I'm not talking about the UI. I'm talking about extending, for example, yes. the database model because we need. Yes. Get, go to the GitForge talk later, please. And uh, we do have one last question from Matrix, which we're probably technically over time for, but we should uh, try to answer anyway, please. Glad we got to the, the chat talk. Um, there's just one question in the chat room. It is somebody asking if they could have a mechanism to package their RPMs together to make Fedora stroke CentOS on their own per, um, PC. Yes, but I'm working on it. Oh, Neil, wait, cool. can you read that again? Like, yeah, yeah. Don't uh, <laughs> 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 we'll do that. Is that a mic drop, literally? Yes, well, it hit me and then fell, and yes. <laughs> Oh, we're out of time. The, um, the question is, can I have a mechanism to package the RPMs together to make Fedora stroke CentOS on my PC? So basically talking about making distribution images that you can then use, I'm, I'm going to guess, or making your copy of the repos. These are all things that um, you know, me and Fedora Release Engineering and other people have been working on as, a, as one of those quote unquote hard problems that take um, time TM to complete. But it is, it is a goal that you should be able to reproduce Fedora on your own computer. If you can't do that, we have failed. Well, who knows? But we're trying. Who wants to do closing? Uh, who wants to do closing? Thank you for coming. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know.